My name is Steve Botsford, and my son and I traveled to South Africa in November 2011 to observe the Hyvex EMF technology as it relates to the treatment of people that are HIV positive. We traveled to South Africa specifically because there is a clinic in downtown Durban that has been treating about a thousand people over the last 15 months. One of our primary reasons for coming to South Africa was a question that a uh, colleague at the University of Notre Dame asked me, and it was, what have you seen with your own eyes? And I have talked to the co-inventor of the machine many times, I've talked to the personnel, but I've never actually seen with my own eyes the treatment. In non-technical terms, the machine is an electromagnetic device that has a resonant frequency that is measured and it sits in the middle of the room in the clinic and the people come in and sit around it and they receive two and a half hour treatment over 12 out of 13 days. Various statistics talk about HIV positive people numbering anywhere from 30 to 40 percent of the population. We went and talked to various village leaders that the clinic had worked with before and told them of the trial that we wanted to do that we would treat the people for free and we wanted 50 or 60 people to come that were in advanced stages of the disease and probably had other infectious diseases along with it like for example maybe tuberculosis. The eight people that, that had the, the most advanced stages of, of the infection had commonalities to them. They typically would come in in wheelchairs or walkers or being helped by somebody. Their energy level was completely down. Um, most of them would lay the first day or two either on the floor or on a chair. Um, very little talking, lots of despair. Typ typically they have somebody that would bring them in, it could be a sister, it could be a wife, and they were very despondent, very scared, and not a lot of hope. It was very depressing. But based upon the stories that I had heard from people that I trust, I was sure that over the next 10 days, I would see a dramatic change. The exciting part was the change started happening on day three. Seth Kelly is a 17-year-old young man that is in high school, came in with his mom who was also tested positive for HIV but it had swollen his feet and swollen his hands so that he couldn't walk. His mother carried him in on her back, had to sit him down in a chair or a wheelchair, depending upon what we had, and they sat there for treatment. So Ailey's one of the first people that we met because we actually went to her home where she lived with 11 brothers, sisters, cousins, orphans with her aunt and has been sick for six to eight months, basically bedridden was very depressed, appeared to have lost a lot of weight. She probably had tuberculosis. Mr. Nguse showed up in the clinic on day one with his wife. He'd been infected for two years, HIV positive for two years. He said that he had pneumonia, that he had tuberculosis, and he had meningitis. He was in bad shape. Bogani is a 46-year-old man that showed up in the clinic the third day of testing, and he had been HIV positive for over two years, had been on his walker over two years, and hadn't walked a step without his walker in two years. Didn't have much of a gleam in his eye. Speech was very slow, uh, depressed, and f definitely in an advanced stage of the HIV infection. The youngest patient that we put into the clinic was a 21-month-old little baby boy who lost his mother two months after he was born. She was HIV positive, he was born HIV positive. His um, face was no smiles on it, no smiles in his eyes. He had more of a brown color to his skin and a brown tint in his hair. He was pretty lifeless. I got on the floor, tried to play with him a little bit, tried to get him to stand up, and if I was holding his hands, he could stand up, but he just he, he, he was lifeless. Tundiwe, 31-year-old woman, showed up in the clinic on the third day of our testing with her sister and was completely exhausted, absolutely no energy. The sister gave the interview. She was crying and was telling the personnel, I don't want my sister to die. And her sister just went over and laid down on the floor and didn't move.
Somewhere around day five, day six, you could feel the enthusiasm of the people. Everybody had a little more bounce in their step. Everybody was excited and we'd play with the kids. There was, there was a sense of relief. There was a sense of excitement. There was a sense of maybe we can get our life back that what we once had. And the only thing that had really changed was that they sat in the Hyvex treatment for two and a half hours for six or seven days. Sakele was very excited on day four. I looked at his feet. I said, why do you have on a pair of socks? He says, my feet don't hurt as much anymore. I said, do you think you can walk into the interview room? And he goes, yeah. And he did. Yes. But how long has it been since you've been able to, to take steps like that? About a month. Maybe a month? Yes. And we talked feeling better, but the walking was the single most important thing for him. So Whaley was more talkative on day four, but she kept getting a little smile on her face and in her eyes. She was feeling better. She had gotten out of bed. She was able to walk outside the house. Mm -hmm. and, but still very shy. But a 30-year-old girl that hasn't finished high school, lost her mom, lives in a house where, where she lives. I didn't really expect a whole lot yet. M Mr. Angusa, on the day of the second interview, came up to me. And then I looked, I noticed that he'd walked up and with just a nice gait. And what he wanted to say was thank you. Most days he'd have to come in with his wife. This particular day his wife had an errand to run and he said to her, you go I'll run your errand and I'll meet you at the clinic. He was real proud of himself. Big smile. One of the highlights of day four was Bongani coming in dressed much better than he was the first day that he came in. And he left his walker outside the interview room and took the eight feet to go to his chair very slowly, shuffling his feet, sat there and told us what had gone on, then walked back out again. And he's just standing there, holding back tears. I'm standing there watching him. I've got tears running down my cheek because here's somebody that hasn't walked in two years. And he was so excited. You could tell it in his eyes, you could tell it. And the whole place gets up, starts clapping, and they go into this song and sing and everything. And it was just unbelievable, unbelievable. Tandiwe, on the fourth day, was starting to show some improvement. She walked into the clinic. It was really pretty amazing. And was being able to talk a little bit about a future, talk about being able to do something. And I asked her sister, what do you think now? She says, I don't think my sister's gonna die now. It's pretty powerful. And over in the corner, the, our little baby, sitting there coloring, and standing up and talking to the other kids. And just later in the day, he's doing bear crawls across the floor with his older brother. He looked like a healthy little, almost two-year-old little boy with his butt up in the air and just going on his hands and feet. It's pretty cool. Talking to the aunt, she was happy. And I imagine that it's been a very a big struggle for her having a sick baby that's not hers, having also lost her sister. The final interview was the Kalen. He was sitting up and he was playing, listening to his music and texting on his phone. And he just got a smile on his face because he, he knew he could do it. He'd just been crunched over so long. 
he had, had a pair of uh, sandals on that day. And I looked at him, I said, you must be walking more. He says, yeah, I'm walking, period. And, I, and his mom sitting next to him, couldn't have a bigger smile on her face. And I look at her and I says, is it good to get him off your back? She doesn't speak much English. She understood what I said. Final interview with Zueli. We got into that she was feeling better, that she was keeping some food down, that she was excited. I've got your card here, and this shows that you've been here 11 times. How you feeling? Lokunas nang dandikai. Go uza wam lang si zaga di dengo wa senga wazu ukambi ni au bizi wa kungu na matol. Skota sekbuhi. Senga wazu no we washi da no we kesa tenga wazu we kes. And then I said, "What well, do you have any dreams?" Popola me guk funda jenga bantu bold. Ingwa zinamu ime ngatsembe di mold. Fourteen days earlier. She wasn't thinking about school, she wasn't thinking about anything. And I think I said as she was leaving, are you glad I came into your house and asked you to come? And she just said, yeah. Our last interview with Bogani, I asked him if he felt, felt good, and he felt that he was getting his life back. Did you ever go through a period before you started coming here that you thought you were going to die? You see, I was thinking about that thing. I was thinking, hey, I'm going to die. And I'm looking at another thing. I'm feeling better and I'm happy. You're not thinking about dying right now? Oh, not, really, not any, anymore. Good. <laughs> I don't think about dying now. Is that a good feeling? Yes, I'm good. I'm, good feeling? I'm good feeling. Yeah. yeah. I'm feeling good. Tan Dway and her sister came in on her last day. Yeah. You know, for the first time I saw her walking by herself, it was like a dream to me. Yeah. It was like a dream because I didn't think maybe he can do this again. And I told her that, you know, I'm praying. Yeah. Because I don't want her to die. So now I'm so excited. Tandiwe was sitting there in front of me and I look in her lap and she's got a phone that she hadn't had before. And she's just texting her friends. And she looks up, she says, how old are you? I said, I'm 61. And then she looks up again, she says, you're old. And I looked at her and I go, yep, and you're gonna get older. She had a smile, said goodbye. As I get ready to go back home, I think back about what I've seen over the last three weeks. And it's, it's what I expected to see because of the people that I know that are involved in it, that I trust and have been keeping me informed on what's been going on in South Africa for the last 10 years. But seeing it firsthand is always amazing because it's, it's a machine that sits in the middle of the room. You can see sadness sitting over here in day one and you can see happiness sitting over here in day eight. And the only thing that has changed is sitting in this room with that machine running that is specifically dialed in to the HIV infection. The, the thing that I am sure of today is that the treatment for the HIV with the machine that we have is working and the people, the people are getting better. What I would hope is that by the scientific community learning more about this technology and the treatment that it does, that they would get behind it to be able to help develop it so that there's more things that it can do for mankind than just work one clinic in South Africa. I learned something special here that you must have hope. Without hope you can you cannot get what you want and and with hope you can be well again. I, I think amazing doesn't tell the story, um, but maybe that's the best word I can think of.